Hello, everyone. So first, I would like to thank the uh, Magical Workshop organizers to offer such a great opportunity. And thanks for Daniel's uh, talk about the advanced simulations. So now I will introduce some uh, parallel intensity measurements about the uh, uh, geomagnetic field. So um, my name is Ting Hong Zhou, and I'm a graduate student from the University of Rochester. Today, I would like to introduce our recent work about the paleomagnetism and the origin of the inner core structure. Uh, the related paper was published on Nature Communications in 2022. So at first, I would like to review some basic features of the geomagnetic field today. First, it is an intrinsic field, and the geodynamo is powered by convection in the outer core, and the energy source to power the outer core convection mainly comes from the growth of the inner core. For example, the latent heat released during the iron solidification and the buoyancy generated by the expulsion of light elements. So the geomagnetic field today is tightly related to the inner core. A seismic and entropy change has been observed in the inner core, the seismic slow direction. Let me see if I can use the mouse, okay. So the seismic slow uh, direction changes from 90 degrees to 54 degrees relative to the Earth's rotation axis. And uh, this change happened at a radius of about 650 kilometer, which is about half size of the inner core today. And this change defines an innermost inner core layer and an outermost inner core layer. So the change of anisotropy reflects the variation of inner core growth pattern and the variation of the inner core growth pattern has been related to the heterogeneity of the heat loss at core mental boundary. The present day deep mental structure is dominated by a spherical harmonic uh, degree two pattern. And um, the anisotropy change of the inner core might indicate an older deep mental structure degree one pattern has been preserved in the innermost inner core. However, the age of this potential change has been unconstrained yet. And uh, so here uh, in our study, we hope to understand the origin of the inner core structure from our paleomagnetism and power intensity study. However, as the first to understanding the whole story, it is essential for us to figure out the inner core nucleation time. A lot of efforts has been, have been made to, uh, to investigate the inner core nucleation time. The one we are looking at here uh, comes from the uh, osmium isotopic study for some blue-related lavas. So uh, some blue-related lavas, they have uh, coupled high osmium um, 186 and osmium 187 ratios. So those signature was interpreted as a core mental interaction because researchers believe, uh, believe that only the outer core source can offer such a high osmium isotopic ratios. And uh, based on the uh, half-lives of their parent isotopes and also the fractionation coefficients, the calculated, uh, in, the calculated inner core age should be older than 3.5 GA. However, this study has some problems. First, later studies find the coupled high osmium isotopic ratios is not exclusive for the outer core. Some mental originated peroxinide or metasomatic sulfides derived from peroxinide or pyridotype mouse can also offer such an isotopic ratio. And also the fractionation coefficients used in those studies are uh, from relatively low temperature, low pressure conditions. So those coefficients might be really different from that in the core. And at la and last, the Hafnian tungsten isotopic studies in the same rock are against the idea that those rocks have an outer core source because those rocks does not have a corresponding negative tungsten 182 anomaly. So based on the, this, um, the interpretation of an early mental core interaction based on the os osmium isotopic uh, ratios from the plume-related rocks is unreliable. And the 3.5 GAH of the inner core is also unreliable. Another way to study the inner core nucleation is uh, from the thermal evolution history of the Earth. So this is straightforward because the inner core was formed when the temperature drops below the freezing point of iron. However, there is a debate in the thermal evolution history study 
um, that is that that is the thermal conductivity of the core. So both high thermal conductivity and low thermal conductivity are reported for the core. High thermal conductivity in value ranges from 90 to 150 watts per meter per Kelvin, uh, leads to a young inner core, for example, younger than 1 GA, and low thermal conductivity in a value about 30 um, leads to an inner core age, like really old inner core age, and uh, it can be as old as 4.2 GA. However, the thermal conductivity only defines the minimum heat extracted from the core. More heat than the minimum value can be extracted. Therefore, even if the core uh, thermal conductivity is lower, the inner core can still be young. And uh, another perspective to study the inner core nucleation is from ge geodynamo and paleomagnetism. So as we mentioned before, the geomagnetic field is tightly related to the inner core. Some simulations show before the inner core nucleation, there will be a weak field state as the kinetic energy of the core approaches or even exceeds the uh, magnetic energy of the core. And after the inner core nucleation, the uh, magnetic field strength would increase as more energy sources are added to the dynamo. However, other simulations believe we cannot see the um, inner core nucleation footprint from the surface parallel intensity measurement because after the inner core nucleated, the dynamo region moves from the shallower um, core mantle boundary to the deeper inner core boundary. Although the field strength in the dynamo region should increase, however, the surface magnetic field strength uh, should not change that much. So instead of a change in power intensity, they believe that um, uh, increased axial octopole component as G3 shown here, can be an indicator for the inner core nucleation. However, as we will show later, this Landau's model does not match with the parallel intensity history. So those are predictions from uh, geodynamo simulations. And um, we really need to look at our parallel magnetism and parallel intensity data to search for the uh, signature of inner core nucleation. One important study about this is Began et al. 2015. So Began study evaluated the quality of parallel intensity data based on the QPI value. And from the selected uh, parallel intensity data, um, there is a decrease at about 2,400 MA and an increase at, at about 1,300 MA. So those mesoproterozoic increase was interpreted as a signature of inner core nucle nucleation. However, Siminov et al. 2016 revisited those data and he pointed out the uh, data contributed to the mesoprotozoic field increase uh, comes from only two localities. One is the 1300 MA Gardner lava flow and the other is the 1100 MA North American Mid-Continent Rift. And uh, many of those individual samples uh, come from those two localities of fit low temperature components and viscous overprints. And this is an uh, example data uh, from the Gaja lava flow. The fit on low temperatures uh, gives an overestimated power intensity value. And uh, Kodama et al. 2019 also revisited the 1.3J Gaja basalts. The new reported power intensity data is much lower than the previously reported value. After removing those overestimates, the mesoproterozoic magnetic field does not show significant change. So the mesoproterozoic inner core age based on the uh, magnetic field uh, change, strength change is not likely. Several years later, Bono et al. 2019 discovered an ultra-low field from parallel intensity measurements of 565 MA self iris intrusive sweet anosocyte. And Bono's study used the teleco parallel intensity method, and he used the single crystal parallel intensity technique, which is a really robust uh, parallel intensity technique. And the uh, reported ultra-low field is lower than 10% of today's geomagnetic field strength. And considering the slow cooling uh, time of the sept ions intrusive sweet anosocyte, bonus data is a time average data. It average out, uh, average the uh, secular variation of the geomagnetic field. So 
Together with a host of studies showing an ED acron unusual field, Bono proposed that this ultra low ED acron field is a fingerprint of inner core nucleation. Besides reporting uh, ultra low field data, Bono also reviewed the published power intensity data. And he plotted the data uh, out uh, using different symbols to show their characteristics. For example, the blue, the blue squares here are power intensity from single crystal measurements, and the gray uh, squares here are from whole rock measurements, and the large squares are time averaged data, the small squares are not time averaged, and the gray dots here are select phenerozoic VDMs. So based on the selected data, Bono used a second order polynomial feed to decide a dominant train of power intensity variation as, the, as shown as the red line here. So this red line shows uh, a gra gradual decay of um, magnetic field strength from 3500 MA to about 500 MA. It indicates the decay of magnetic energy uh, over time. Superimposed variability can happen because of local and temporal heat flux change as a core mental boundary. The EDFR ultra low field uh, proposed, uh, discovered by, by uh, Bono and his uh, proposal that it can be an indicator for the inner core nucleation matches with some simulation work. This is a simulation uh, from Trisco 2016. This simulation predicts the inner core was formed at about 650 MA. And before the inner core nucleated, there, there, was a, there is a weak field state uh, when the core's kinetic energy approaches or even exceeds the magnetic energy of the core. So Bono's study and Driscoll simulations are uh, independent studies. They demonstrated the same thing in different perspectives. After Bono 2019, uh, sorry, 2019 ultra low field data, the ED acron ultra low field is later supported by uh, other power intensity studies, for example, from Ukraine and uh, Ontario. And we also have new published power intensity data for 550 MA and 720 MA. Those new uh, published power intensity data um, mainly comes from dikes, and they use the several different power intensity methods, for example, microwave method, Shaw method, Wilson method, and also Kelly method. So overall, the updated power intensity data and the uh, Bono 2019 uh, time average data both indicate um, out an ED acron ultra low field and suggesting this is a global future and the supposed inner core was nucleated at ED acron period. So after the ultra low field um, and, the, uh, and, and the inner core nucleation, more energy sources, such as the latent heat released by the ion solidification and the um, and, and the buoyancy generated by the expulsion of the light elements should add energy sources to the dynamo. So the field strength should increase. However, it has been unclear how long the ultra low field state lasted and how the magnetic field was recovered. So our study here um, hopes to investigate the field recovery process after the ultra low field. And as a reminder, our study also hopes to understand the origin of inner core structure from our power intensity and power magnetism study. So with those scientific questions, we sampled the Glen Mountain Layered Complex Anosocyte from Wichita Mountains province in Oklahoma. This is the geological map, and the sampling sites are marked as stars. The Glen Mountain Layered Complex is one of the oldest rock exposed in Wichita Mountains province. And the age of the anosocyte is determined by high precision uranium lead dating um, at 532 MA. Uh, so we sampled orientated hand samples from four sites, and we focused our study on two sites here, and they have six subsites in total. Um, those are some field pictures, and this is an overview of Wichita Mountains area, and those are the uh, anosocyte we sampled. So we use the single crystal power intensity technique to do the power intensity measurement. But before that, we need to understand the magnetic properties of the whole rock and other site. 
So we performed a rock magnetism study and also did alternating field demagnetization for the, for, for the whole rock samples. And this is the rock ma magnetism uh, results for the whole rock anosocyte. The upper panel are um, susceptibility versus temperature curves. The first two are low temperature KT curve and the last two are high temperature KT curves. And from the low temperature KT curves, uh, we can see a very transition at about negative 150 Celsius, which is a sign of magnetite. And from the high temperature KT curve, um, the, the uh, heating curve shows a, a large drop at about 580 Celsius, which is also a sign of magnetite. And uh, there is a minor uh, drop at about uh, 320 Celsius, which can be a sign of titanium magnetite. And uh, for the uh, hysteresis measurements and the fork diagram, um, for some grand mass materials, they show a mixture behavior of single domain, pseudo single domain, or and multi domain um, grains. But for other material, for other ground mass materials, they show typical multi domain behavior. And the multi domain one is the it's more common one. And we performed alternating field demagnetization for the whole rock anosocyte. We isolated a stable characteristic uh, remnants from 12 samples, and those characteristic remnants have different polarities. And those directions passed a, a reversal test, which means those uh, NRMs are very likely to be primary remnants. And we also compared our direction with uh, the published Roggenson at all 1981 data. They matched very well. And uh, using our uh, sampling site as a reference site, we calculated a parallel latitude as 3.7 degree north. More detailed parallel latitude study is still in progress, so please stay tuned about that. So uh, this is a summary for the whole rock and society magnetic property. For the magnetic carriers, uh, they are dominant by magnetite and titanium magnetite. And the domain state is a mixture of MD, PSD, and SD, but the MD is the more common one. And for the NRM, the uh, anosocyte, the whole rock anosocyte, um, are very likely to carry primary NRM. So this means the whole rock anosocyte can be good material for paling, for paleomagnetism study. But because of the widespread existence of the MD grain, the whole rock anosocyte might not be good material for pallet intensity study. So to get reliable pallet intensity measurements, we move forward to study the single plagioclase crystals. We first select clean plagioclase crystals in about three millimeter size, and we did rock uh, magnetism measurements first. The hysteresis measurements and the fork diagrams show the dominant magnetic carriers in the plagioclase crystals are non-interacting single domain or pseudo single domain grains. And this single domain behavior is supported by our scanning electron microscope study. We found uh, tiny elongated magnetic needles uh, with scanning electron microscope. Those needles are usually 50 to 200 nanometer wide and several micrometer long. The energy disper dispersive spectroscopy analysis show those uh, grains are titanomagnetite or magnetite. So the single, single domain behavior of the um, plagioclase crystals show they are good material for parallel intensity analysis. At this moment, we already know enough information about the uh, plagioclase crystals, so we can start our, our power intensity measurements. Um, the power intensity theory is based on a linear relationship between the ambient field and the acquired magnetization. And if we know the NRM and we know the lab acquired magnetization and the applied lab applied field, we can calculate the parallel intensity based on this equation. However, the linear relationship between the ambient field and the record magnetization is not always being satisfied. This relationship only works for single domain grains. It doesn't work for multi-domain grains. And also it requires the sample is not altered during the experiments. We used the tally code method um, and we used the single crystal parallel intensity technique to measure the parallel intensity. 
this technique has a lot of advantages. So uh, first, we pre-select clean plagioclase crystals, which can minimize the existence of multi-domain grains. And the single crystal can protect the magnetic grains, um, reduce the chance of the, uh, for them to be, re, uh, to be altered. And also, we use a CO2 laser to heat the sample with shorter heating time of about 90 to 120 seconds. The shorter heating time can also um, can also help the sample avoid uh, alteration in some extent. So before the teleco uh, experiment, we performed the total TRM measurement at first. Through this uh, experiment, we hope to understand the unblocking temperature spectrum of the crystals, so we can use it as a reference for later experiments. And uh, we also want to get a rough estimate of power intensity from this experiment. So um, to do this experiment, we first thermally de stepwise demagnetized the sample, and then at the uh, at a temperature point which is a little higher than the highest unblocking temperature, we applied a TRM, and then we thermally uh, stepwise demagnetized the TRM again. By comparing the TRM decay curve and the NRM decay curve, we can get a rough estimate of the power intensity. So we performed this experiment for nine uh, crystals, and the highest unblocking temperature ranges from 400 to 520 Celsius. And uh, we obtained the power intensity from three samples, and the average value is 13.9 plus minus 7.1 microtesla. So after that, we performed the important teleco method accompanied with partial, PTR, partial TRM checks. Um, the procedure to do the teleco experiment is similar to the uh, total TRM experiment, but instead of applied a TRM as the highest unblocking temperature, we applied a TRM at each temperature step after the NRM was removed. So the remaining NRM and the acquired TRM data are plotted on the uh, array plot. The slope of this bit line times, to, times the applied lab field is the uh, uh, power intensity. To select uh, reliable uh, power intensity data, we applied strict uh, selection criteria. And among the 117 samples we measured, we accept the results from 17 uh, crystals. And the mean power intensity result is 18.9 plus minus 5.4 microtesla. We also consider the potential dependence of the power intensity results on the lab applied field. So we applied uh, 15 microtesla and the 30 microtesla fields uh, during our experiments. And our results show the um, average power intensity for those two applied fields are indistinguishable, which means there is no significant dependence. And we also consider the uh, anisotropy effect on the, for the uh, power intensity measurement. We did anisotropy correction following the which at all 1984 uh, method. And the anisotropy factor of our um, plagio place crystals ranges from 0.7 to 1.4. And we also consider the cooling rate uh, effect on the power intensity measurement. The cooling time of the Glen Mountain layers complex another side is constrained by the geo chronology study as about 500,000 500, years. And following the Houchdale et al. 1980 method, uh, we found that our raw power intensity data may overestimate the power field by a factor of 1.5. So before the correction, our raw power intensity results is 18.9 plus minus 5.4 microtesla. And after the anisotropy correction and the cooling rate correction, our final power intensity data is 13.7 plus minus 3.4 microtesla. And considering the relatively slow cooling time of the Glen Mountain Slate complex another site, um, our data is a time average data, and the corresponding paleomagnetic dipole moment is 3.4 plus minus 0.9 times 10 to the 22nd ampere meter square. So let's review the long term uh, evolution of the power intensity data again. The x axis is the age, and the y axis is the field strength. The blow up here is uh, uh, like um, a zoom in view for the power intensity data from 500 
to 750 hundred, uh, sorry, 750 MA. And our new panel intensity data from the 532 MA for the mountain slate complex another site is plotted as the red square here. And it is about five times higher than the ED Akron ultra low field. And uh, our data reflects a rapid recovery of geomagnetic field strengths in about 33 million years. Such a rapid increase also matches with the uh, uh, prediction of, of, sim uh, of simulations as after the inner core nucleated, more energy sources such as the latent heat released by the solidification of iron and also the uh, buoyancy generated by the expulsion of light elements those new sources are added to the dynamo. So our new power intensity data in turn further support an in the accurate ultra low, uh, in the accurate inner core nucleation age. And uh, our high quality time averaged power intensity data, along with the time averaged in the accurate ultra low field data, constraints and inner core nucleation onset age at about 550 MA. And if and we then use this onset age as a no no condition uh, in a thermal evolution model, and this is our new result thermal evolution model. The the x axis uh, here is the age, and the left y axis and the red line shows the radius of the inner core, and the right y axis and the uh, yellow line shows the core mantle boundary heat flux. Our new thermal uh, our new thermal evolution model shows the inner core grows to half of its current size at about 450 MA. And as a reminder, this is where the boundary of outermost inner core and innermost inner core is located. So as we mentioned before, the growth pattern of the inner core is related to the heterogeneity of heat loss at core mantle boundary. The present day deep mantle structure sets a boundary condition for the inner core growth pattern today. That is to say, the present day deep mantle structure controls the anisotropy pattern of the outermost inner core. So our uh, thermal evolution model shows the inner core grows to the boundary of the innermost inner core and outermost inner core at about 450 MA. So we suggest that the present deep mantle structure started to form at about 450 MA. And the imprint of a prior deep mantle structure degree one pattern might be preserved in the innermost inner core. So uh, that's, that's my whole story today. And uh, this study is supported by NSF and it is a collaborative work between different institutions. I want to thank NSF and our collaborators here and thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, no. uh, any questions? Hey, thanks. I, I'm just curious when I look at this, I see in the young ages lots of variability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my question is always, how do you know when you have the right result? How many data do you need where you think that you, you've seen all the variability in the field and you're confident that, that it's low or that it's high? Okay. So, um, yeah. This, so are you mean like a certain data? Like, I mean, how much variability, how many data do you yeah. need? I mean, do you also yeah. think like the, the standard deviation of the data has meaning? Okay. Right? Okay. So um, I would think this question in um, like uh, this way. Uh, so to say it is a reliable power intensity measurement, it should be like average out the circular variation. So it requires the raw cools like uh, for like long, long enough time. So for our uh, data, so the cooling time is about 500,000 years. So it is long enough to average out the secular variation. So it's not uh, like um, a temporal or local thing. So, and another way to think about that is um, if there are other um, data to suggest it is a global feature, 
such as the Bono 2019 ultra low field. So that uh, that data was later supported by other power intensity measurements uh, from different locations. So I have to say that data is like really robust. And yeah, for yeah, so I would say that's, that's my consideration. Do you think that there were periods of time, let's say, where the variability of the, 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 the strength stayed very constant? And so you would expect uh, data points that are very tightly grouped. And other times, like today, that there is a very wide variability in the strengths. So, so that's what you would argue here. So you would argue, like your argument here, which might be true, might not, but I, I, I'd like the behavioral intensity to be, think about this more often, is, you know, do you have enough observations to really say this is the right result? Okay, yeah, I, I see your point. So like the present day, like the, those gray dots here, those are uh, VDMs, those are not time averaged. So it can like widespread because of the local variations of on the core mental boundary, like the heat flux variation on the core mental boundary. But uh, if the data is time averaged, it might be like more um, con uh, concentrated. So it would go like spread like this. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So I think it's like an open question now. So we just, we, we know that the inner core growth is like controlled by the heat flux at the core mental uh, boundary, but we don't know how the heat flux really like affect the anisotropy pattern or the, uh, the growth rate. So I think it's still an open question, but like they are, they definitely have some relationship to each other. Yeah. Yeah, hi, there are obviously a lot of moving parts of this talk. It's quite impressive. Um, I wanted to ask you if you can tell us a bit about how you estimate the cooling rate for your, um, your samples, because that's obviously a key question in determining what the time average is. And um, also in think we really do need to think about how long you need to average over in order to get a viable estimate of the average field. So can you make some comments on those things? Okay, so for uh, my sample, um, the cooling time is constrained by the geochronology uh, study. So they date like the uh, adjacent uh, geological units, like above and below. So, I mean, younger and older, then they constrain the, and, and with some geological observations, they uh, constrain the cooling time of the anosite uh, as 500,000 years. So yeah, that's uh, how the cooling time of my sample was decided. So that would be an upper bound on cooling Sorry, what? That would be an upper bound on cooling rate. Yeah, and also we uh, used the thermal um, evolution, like the uh, model, you know, the, the like thermal cooling model. Uh, we also used that uh, to calculate the cooling time and that gives a much longer time than the 500,000 years. So that's another thing, yeah. So does that apply to all these things in the system? <laughs> Can you say that again? Uh, that seems to me to imply that, that there's an inconsistency in your estimate. So um, the cooling, I mean, the um, cooling time estimated by the thermal model is based on the volume of the, of the magma. I think that estimation is more rough so it's like when you don't have a um, certain geochronology um, method to constrain the, constrain the time, you can re refer to that method. But now we have the um, uh, decided uh, 
the time from the geo chronology study. So we so we decide to use the data from the uh, geo chronology study. Yeah. So your rest would be the other value of the time of being Yeah. And you think that's enough to average out the secular variation? Um. So is. Yeah, I mean, from the from the number, it is larger than the um, required time, and and I think the other thing is when we perform the power intensity uh, measurements, so we have seventeen crystals, and those crystals are um, the results are constant, are very constant, are co consistent. So there is no sign to say that our data cannot average out the. Uh, Secular variation and also like we sampled from different locations. I mean, they are different size and they are like uh, a lot of they are far away from each other. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, fantastic talk. I really like your 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 presentation of yeah theoretical motivation and and your data. Um, I, I think your paleo latitude results are super, super exciting. Um, so I'm really excited for those to uh, come out. I mean, one of the things that seems really impactful about your work here is having uh, been out of this lower field regime, being much closer to what is the long term Paleozoic average, and then, as you pointed out, showing stable decal impressions. So, I mean, there's huge puzzles of paleogeography uh, coming in out of the EDAC and into the, in the Cambrian. Laurentia is um, will be will be great. So I guess I just have one question on the paleo latitude that you presented is um, how you're dealing with the the correction. Um, are you using the the igneous foliation um, within the within the unit? Are you using overlying units? Okay, so there might be some uh, tilt, but like from the the uh, size we're using here. Um, it is not obvious. So yeah, we did not do the tilt correction for this data, but I, I think like, as I uh, mentioned, more detailed research is still in progress. So yeah, hope to communicate with you later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's really exciting. And I, I have one other question, which is I'm just sort of wondering the rationale of not continuing to update this, this plot here with additional data. So I'm just thinking here with the data from uh, the Liverpool lab, where there's data, and I realize that they're not these long, long term, slowly cooled units, right? They're taking a photo and trying to do many quickly cooled uh, units and then they take into this. But like the data from the one these all dikes at 755, they have interesting the variables from the data from the Franklin, Franklin dikes. So is there a reason those aren't being like that sort of work that's, that's going in there isn't going up? Like, do you have reasons not to put those on the compilation? Or Question just I mean it's exciting that there's you know multiple groups pushing that these you know are the values. Okay. So uh you mean like how do you comment to those data here? Oh I guess maybe they are there. Yeah, those are here. Yeah. Maybe those are here. They're funding well, it's not. Okay, so um I think like it's the way like we present the data. So um um as I mentioned, like the um palintense data for the later it apparent from later it apparent palintensity studies um are like from dikes and they use the several palintensity method. So uh in the figure here, like we separate the results from different um methods, and we want to see if the results of different methods if they are consistent. And yeah, so those are yeah, those are separate uh results from different methods. So it might look different than their original published data, but they are the same. Maybe I'm just, I mean, there are, maybe I'm just, in my mind, I didn't pull that down. Yeah. 55 values. I guess it's slightly out of zoom, but yeah. not even on the same line. But some of the Liverpool. Yeah. Any more questions?